Now, you know, the lyrics to that are, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. And it is gone because it got replaced by snow, right? <laughs> so, but don't worry about the snow. Let's focus on the I can see clearly because I want to welcome you to Horizon and to a new series that we're doing called Easter Eggs where we're going to learn how to see clearly by finding some of God's hidden clues in the Bible. Things that help us make sense of the world and make sense of our lives, sense of ourselves, and and even God. And you know, as we think about that, I know that we live in a world that is full of chaos, that's full of confusion. And so we thought as a team it would also be important just to take a moment this morning while we're gathered and pray over everything that's going on in Ukraine and with Russia because it weighs on a lot of us. I've had a lot of conversations this week with guys where it's even for them producing anxiety as far away as it is, let alone for the people who are there. So would you just bow your head with me and and let's pray for a moment. Our Father in heaven, I know that I don't understand all of the details of everything that is going on over there and what has led to it or what's coming next. You know, I'm sure that I can't even fathom, you know, the images that we see of destruction and of families that have been torn apart. And Lord, we have begin to feel some of that impact here, but to be in the midst of it. And yet, Lord, we know that you are a good God. We know that you have a plan. We know that you care about what happens to people. And so, God, we are just asking you that you would confuse the plans of evil Lord, that you would even make them to to backfire. God, that you would bring peace where there is no peace, comfort where there is no comfort, that you would protect the innocent, God. And Lord, in the midst of it, we know there are people even in Russia who are mourning, you know, the things that are being done. We know that there are people in Ukraine and surrounding areas and across the world who are just grieving over what's happening And so, God, we pray that you would make yourself known, that people in those places who trust you, who know you, who call you their God, would step up with courage, and that we would too, Lord, as we think and we pray for the things that you're doing in those places and how you might bring healing to those people. God, I'm sure there's things I I should be praying that I just don't even understand and I don't know, and so I just ask that you would take even those things that we don't think of and be at work, Lord. And we will ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking that, that minute with us because as we look at the Bible, like if we really believe that that's true, then we believe that there are things that we find there that make a difference in our everyday. That there are things that we are looking for and that we wonder what we'll find.
Good morning again. Uh, today we're starting a brand new series called Easter Eggs. Um, and I know it's hard to believe that Easter is uh, not too far around the corner because you're all wearing coats and scarves. Um, but before we know it, we will have the warm spring sunshine shining on our faces. Um, and I think of the song that the band just played. And there are those moments in life where we, we wish God would just shine into our lives and give us a little direction, a little input, uh, maybe a nudge in, in a direction that he wants us to go. Um, but if we're honest, um, actually God has left us some signs of a plan in our life. Um, and they're not always easy to see at first. It's a little bit like when you hide Easter eggs, okay? Remember hiding those for your kids? Um, that you don't make it amazingly obvious. You don't just dump them on the floor in the living room and say, find the eggs, kids. Um, you you kind of hide them with a little intentionality and a little bit of purpose. Um, well, God has done just that, that he's hidden these signs and clues of the plan that he has for our lives. Um, and Drew's going to talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, but for now, we're going to have a little fun, okay? Because as adults, you don't often get to do Easter egg hunts anymore, do you? So we are going to do like a virtual Easter egg hunt, okay? On the, the stage with me here, you'll see these really uh, neat and orderly bookshelves behind me, okay? And on these bookshelves, you're going to see that there are a variety of Easter eggs, okay? There are Easter eggs of all colors and shapes, sizes, uh, designs on them. Um, they're going to put up a picture even on the big screen in case you're watching at home or you're, you know, you need that little help to see the eggs. Um, and Dave here, Dave on the keys is going to play us a little Jeopardy music. And I want you to see how many eggs you can find in about 20 seconds, okay? So here we go. Start the clock in your head. Start the calculator in your head. You ready, Dave? All right, let's do it. Let's count eggs. Seven. 
All right, you guys counting eggs? You seeing some there? Some are easy to find, right? Some are really obvious, the gi gigantic eggs. Some of them I'm not sure if they're eggs or not. There's a little cat that's kind of egg-shaped. Not quite sure of that, but uh, have you have you seen anybody throw out a number? What's a number that you have in, that you've seen? How many eggs? 118. I think that's a guess, but I'm gonna give it to you. <laughs> well, let's take a look. Okay, let's take a closer look at these eggs. Let's examine them here. Um, oh wow! So some of these eggs they light up, right? Like I'm sure you saw the gigantic ones here, but there's also some little ones here. There's some in the jars. Like I said, I'm not sure if this is an egg or not. No, it's a squishy. Okay, let's look over here. We got more eggs over here, right? Well, well, this is kind of the, uh, the concept of this series is that God has spoken and there's wisdom in the Bible to be found. And sometimes, if I'm being honest, the Bible kind of feels like one of these bookshelves to me that, man, there's a lot on there and it's interesting, but it, it seems like I can't quite make sense of it. Um, but what Drew's going to do today is help us unpack one of those Easter eggs um, that God has for us in the Bible. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> I, th I was at about 23, so I, I hear voices around me that either got less or more, and I don't know which one of us uh, forgot our glasses today, but I had one right next to me. Because when I think about Easter eggs, Ryan's right, I think about the stuff that is hidden on Easter morning that always has some kind of little goodie inside of it, or it's, it's beautifully colored. Or the other way you sometimes hear this phrase is, is like in a video game or a movie where they say that, oh, there's an Easter egg. You got to watch for it. And again, it's a little something that is hidden. But if you see it, like if you're in the know, it brings a smile to your face. And maybe it's a hint about something going on in the movie. Maybe it's even a hint about something coming in the future, in a future movie. But whatever it is, and however you think about it, the idea of the Easter egg is that it's something that you are meant to find that's going to bring you some enjoyment. It's going to be good for you. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in this series. We have a chance to find God's hidden clues. That when we pick up the Bible, it, it can seem like these shelves. That you, you read a page of the Bible and you almost wonder, like, what are all those things? Like, is it a, a cat or a squishy or an egg? Like, I'm not exactly, it's there, it's there, I can see it, but I don't get it and I don't know what to do with it, right? But God has given us these hidden clues that, that help us unpack the Bible in a way that we can better understand who we are, who he is, and what's going on in the world around us. So here's one of them. This one comes from something called a psalm. The psalm is basically a word for songs, but some of them are collected in the Bible. And so I just want to read this one to you and see how much sense this makes. It says, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So let's say that that's... That's our hidden clue. There, there's an Easter egg for us. But at first glance, that looks a lot like one of these messy bookshelves. Like, I can sound out all the words. I know what most of them mean in a vacuum, but I'm not totally sure what's connecting to what here and what is kind of the main point. So this was written by a guy named David. David is one of history's most successful and most famous kings. And what's unique about David is that he was not only a political leader, but he also functioned like something of a spiritual leader for his kingdom. And throughout his life, David wrote careful journals of what he was experiencing. Things about life, things about death, things about God. And many of those journals have been collected as psalms. And people still read them today. David lived about 3,000 years ago. People still read them today, and they read them religiously, for lack of a better word. They read them to understand themselves, to understand the world, to understand God, to understand life. But why? Because I, I love history, and I like to read about ancient kings. One of my favorite time periods is the Greco-Roman era. There's just so much cool stuff that comes out of that. So... I've actually read through some of Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars, where it's, it's like Caesar's own journal, maybe telling the truth about how great he is, <laughs> as he's fighting through all of these wars and taking over his empire. And so I like to read those too, but I don't read them religiously. 
I'm not picking up Julius Caesar to try to understand God, to try to understand myself or how to, how to be the dad I want to be or the husband I want to be or the person I want to be or the boss I want to be. Like, I don't go to Julius Caesar for that. But 3,000 years later, people are still reading stuff like this and saying, that changes my life. Why? Because if you fast forward 1,000 years from David, still 2,000 years ago for us, this guy Jesus shows up. And people say, and Jesus said himself, that the things that David was writing a thousand years ago were actually promises about him. Jesus says that he's fulfilling all of the things that David was writing. And now here we sit today, and for centuries, billions of people throughout the centuries and billions of people today believe that their life should be different based on Jesus. Why? I mean, think about this. Uh, I want you to see a quote here from an author named Bart Ehrman. And Bart is an atheist. So he is not a Christ follower. He doesn't believe that, that God is real. And yet, his life, his career has been devoted to the history of the Christian faith. And this is what he says about it, that Christianity not only took over an empire, it radically altered the lives of those living in it. And on an even more fundamental level, the very understanding billions of people had about what it means to be human. However one evaluates the merits of the case, like whether you actually believe that it's all true or not, no one can deny it was the most monumental cultural transformation our world has ever seen. But wait a minute. The founder of that movement, Jesus, was rejected and killed by his own people. In fact, after Jesus' life, there was organized religious and political energy and funding to snuff out the Christian movement. And yet here we sit thousands of years later with billions of people who are still convinced not only that it's true, but that it should affect the way that they live. Why? Why would we still read this book? Why would we care about God's hidden clues? Why would we even bother showing up to Horizon on a Sunday morning or checking it out online later if the founder of the movement was killed, if he died? Well, maybe you see where I'm going with this, but quite simply, it's because he didn't stay dead. That's the claim. And for thousands of years, billions of people have been so convinced that it continues to grow today. In fact, one of the people who was actually part of the team trying to snuff out Christianity, who was so convinced it was wrong that he was willing to arrest and even kill people for it, was a man named Paul. Now, today we know him as the Apostle Paul, and some of his letters are in this book. Because he then became so convinced when he pushed up against it as hard as he could, he became so convinced that Jesus really is who he says he is, that he really did what he says he did, that he really came to do what he says he came to do, that Paul flip-flopped his entire life and dedicated everything to making sure people understood exactly who Jesus was. And so when he was asked, why would you make that change? Come on, like a guy came back from the dead, really, Paul? I mean, you understand you had everything going for you, including governmental backing to take down the Christ followers until you decided to be one of them. Well, here's how he explains it in Acts 13. These are Paul's own words. He points out that God raised Jesus from the dead. No more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Okay, so he's connecting back to something that we've heard. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've, we've heard that somewhere before. We've heard that. For David, after he served his own generation, by the will of God, fell asleep. 
Okay, euphemism for died. Was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. Which is not like political corruption or doing the wrong thing. The, the word here, they're trying to be gentle, but it basically means David's corpse rotted. Because that's what happens when you die. It, it's kind of grotesque, but Paul wants to be very clear. David the great and powerful king, as wonderful as he was, and for all the things that he wrote that we're still reading, David served his generation, died, was buried, and he's decaying in a grave. That's where his body can be found. In fact, a couple years ago, I had a chance to go to Israel, and it's one of the, the big sightseeing things on the tour. It's like, oh, we're going to the grave of the great King David. And realistically, there's like a percentage of certainty, like are we sure that this is really the spot? But here's what we are sure. David's body is decaying, Paul says. So whatever he was saying back there, that the Holy One won't see corruption, the Holy One won't decay, it can't have been about David. Instead, Paul says, he whom God raised up saw no corruption. So there's like a lot going on in those verses, but this is what it boils down to. Paul knows that you all love your great and powerful King David. He knows that you're all kind of confused about Jesus, but here's the primary thing that for Paul changed everything he thought about who Jesus was. Resurrection. David died and stayed dead. Jesus died and came back to life. Now, right there is one of those like, yeah, I, I knew I walked into something religious this morning because we're talking about miracles. Like we're talking about things that are hard to process. Like am I really supposed to believe that Jesus raised himself from the dead? Because here's the deal. If that's true, if that's true, then whatever he says is probably pretty important because no one else has ever done that. Nobody else could. If that's not true, why would I read the Bible at all? If David prophesied, he predicted that Jesus was going to raise himself from the dead and that's why we should trust him as God and Savior. Like, if it's true, I probably have to pay attention. If it's not, why do I bother with any of this? And so Paul says, he was so convinced it's true, that's why he bothers with all of this. Now here's the thing. As complicated as that can be, that one thing, resurrection, unlocks everything else in this book. Resurrection is the key to some amazing discoveries that we find in the pages of the Bible. In fact, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, you think about Easter eggs in movies. If you saw um, The Sixth Sense, which... Like, that was like 1999, so do we still have to worry about spoiling the sixth sense? <laughs> so, maybe I'll try not to, but let's just put it this way. When you get to the end of the movie and they tell you about the color red, okay, first time I see the movie and then you see that, they tell you about the color red, you're like, what? I, I, I immediately want to watch the movie again so I can watch for all the places red shows up. Like, that's what resurrection is. You get to this moment with Paul and he says, don't you realize? Resurrection makes us want to go back and say, where was it? And kind of like our Easter egg hunt today, like now that you know it's, it's a squishy cat, it's not an egg, you won't count that one anymore. <laughs> now that you know about the glowing ones, like now that you know where they are, you can see them. Now they're easier to find. And so that key of resurrection is going to help us with three critical discoveries. And the first one is this. Because of resurrection, hey, here's one. I can discover an inheritance that never diminishes. Now think about that claim. Because I know you've been watching the stock market just like I have. It's amazing how those numbers just keep getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> magic. It just devalues like magic. I had money, now I have less money. Where did it go? I didn't spend it. It devalues. It diminishes. Right? I mean, you think about even the, even the possessions and things that we leave behind. They don't last forever and we know it but even the things that that last for a long time like we don't have them forever like an inheritance is something i leave to other people but if resurrection is true 
then the Bible says there's something I can inherit that lasts forever. So let's go back to Psalm 16, back to this journal of David, and watch how resurrection unlocks this. Just a few lines earlier, he says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Now, if we're reading that for the first time through, we hear inheritance, we're thinking possessions, we're thinking money. But if we're reading that through the filter of resurrection, look at what he's saying. Because you know that by the end of this journal, he's talking about even if I die, you won't leave me there. The inheritance he's talking about is something that can't devalue. It can't diminish. It can't fade. A thousand years later, when Jesus was teaching on the earth, he talked about this same thing, saying this is why it's so dangerous if, if we're building up all of our treasure on earth. Moths come in and chew it up. Rust is going to destroy it. The sands of time will wear that thing down. And besides, you're going to end up leaving it behind to somebody else and they won't take care of it anyway. And you put all your eggs in that basket jesus says what if you stored up treasure in heaven what if the treasure in heaven was something you couldn't even imagine because here it's like gold and in heaven gold is pavement the streets are paved with gold we just walk on gold because the other stuff is so much better what might that be like and not only that but he says that god maintains the lot it is god who keeps it from diminishing it's a picture of an inheritance that only makes sense if there really is life after death. If the resurrection of Jesus means that there is actually eternal life available to us too. I got coffee with a buddy of mine this week. And I don't, I don't know if you ever have this experience. Like there's somebody that you've, you've known them for a while, but you haven't seen them for a while. And then when you see them, it's like something's different. And not, not like a haircut or like he shaved or something like that. But I've known this guy for about four years, and when we sat down for coffee, it was like there was just like a different joy about him, a different peace. He, he, it's like the most clear thinking I've ever seen him. And so I didn't, I didn't say anything. I didn't want to be like, hey, dude, you, like, you're happy for once or you know, something, because of course I've seen him happy. It's just, but there was just something. So I just listened to him as he was talking, and I said, hey, so tell me, you know, tell me what's going on in your life. How are things going? He says, well, I got an executive coach. So there's been a guy who's meeting with him every week, giving him like one-to-one -one personal drill down, deep dive on what would help him grow, but not just in his career, like that's definitely one of the layers, but what would help him grow as a person. And so he said one of the things that his, his coach recommended to him is that he needs solitude, like that we all need solitude, especially leaders, to have time where you're not go, 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 go. And it's not even just like I'm alone for an hour, you know, watching TV, because then, like, at the end of the hour, like, my brain's still cluttered, but just quiet. Still. And then to do some really purposeful reading. And so one of his uh, hobbies he just enjoys is investing. So every morning he sets aside an hour of time to read. And one of the things he reads about is investments and investing and tips for investing. You know, chasing down that inheritance and some of those things. The other thing he reads is skill stuff for work, right? To, to improve his career as he's thinking at that executive level. What can I do differently? How can I shape my team? How can I lead them? How do we get through these challenges? But the third thing, the first thing that he reads every day is the Bible. And then he said he sets a timer on his phone so that he's not even te tempted to check. Like how, if has it been long enough yet? Sets a five-minute timer on his phone and then just sits quietly and tries not to think too much in case there's something he just read that God would want to say to him. He said that's the big difference in his life right now. Like kind of setting out that discipline to try to hear from God, to try to make sense of this book. That essentially it's like God becomes his executive coach. And I love that because it's exactly what David figured out. 
You look at the next couple lines of this verse, of this psalm. He says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. You see, God sees David as a guide. Preserve me, for in you I put my trust. Now now think about what he's saying. Do you know God like that? Have you ever thought about God that way? Like, I don't know about you, but it's, it's easy many times to think about God as if he is someone I'll meet when I die. Right? Like, when I die, if this all turns out to be true then we're all going one way or the other, and I guess when I stand at the pearly gates, I'll meet God and I'll find out which way I'm going. That is so not the picture of the Bible. Like, it's true that everybody goes somewhere when we die, but God wants you to live with him forever in heaven. And he doesn't think that you have to wait till you die to meet him. Like, I, I, like isn't that totally how you picture it, though? Like, I die, then I stand at the pearly gates, and here comes St. Peter, and oh, man, I don't even get to meet God if I don't get past Peter, Right? And the whole time he's saying, why should I let you in? I'm like, uh, uh, so well, I tried to give over here and I, the, I helped that lady across the street. And like, but you can see that his hand is on the lever and you realize like there's a trap door underneath you. And so you start going faster. You're like, and um, I, you know, I tried to be patient with my kids. and I know it wasn't really that much. It's like it's starting to creak a little bit. That's not the picture. In fact, what David discovered is that if resurrection is real, if God is offering us eternal life, it's actually built out of our relationship with him and it begins right now. He said, the Lord has given me counsel. So for David as king, saying, man, I wonder what God has to say about how I run this kingdom. How God would run this company. How God would run this team. I wonder what God might say in this moment. What would, how, how would God be patient in this moment with my family? What would that look like? Well, someday when I die, I'll ask him what I should have done differently. (laughs) Now God says, I'm with you right now. I can give you counsel right now. David feels like the Lord is at his right hand. You imagine, if if God is who he says he is, your right-hand man is God? What an amazing picture. You see, that's what my buddy's begun to figure out. Not only for like, what rules am I supposed to follow, but how does God actually guide me through my life? See, that's our second discovery. Because of resurrection, I can discover a guide worth trusting. And we want you to have a chance to explore that. Because maybe for you, that's like, hey, I heard all that stuff as a kid, but like, I've been out of it for a while, and I'm not sure that I'm thinking about God the right way. Or, hey, I'm open to the idea that God's out there, and I think the Bible has some really good tips in it. Like, I'd like to know more about how can I be a better person? How can I do better with my family? Like, what, what would that look like? So I just want to tell you, first of all, if you think the Bible is only a book of good advice, like, it is loaded with good advice. But the Bible is God's story of love for you because he wants resurrection for you. And like, if you hear that and you're like, that's what I've been waiting to hear, awesome. Receive it today. That's for you. If you're like, I would like to ask a few more questions first. Awesome. Like, that's what we're here for. Horizon is yours to explore. And so many of the things that we do are to try to create that space that you can explore who God is and how he might guide you. In fact, one of those things that we have coming up, we call four critical decisions. So we actually did this last fall as a guys group, and it's backed by popular demand, and it's open to everybody because we got so much positive feedback from this. And, and that subtitle... Four critical decisions successful leaders make across men and women was like, this is good stuff where God is trying to guide us. So this time, instead of a four-week group, we're doing it as one Saturday morning session on April 2nd from 8 to 1130 a.m. You can see the link there for how to, how to sign up and, and register and all those things. We'd love to see you there because it's one of those places we get to explore God as a trustworthy guide. It, it will be practical for you whether you are like into that or not. But you'll also get to see a hint, some of the hidden clues of just who God is and how he wants to guide you. You know, I think the first people in my life I ever met who, like, understood God that way 
Because my, my temptation always is like, I think I'm standing on a trap door and I'm just waiting for the lever. It's like, God just doesn't talk to us that way in the Bible. He has such a better picture. And probably the first people that I, I realized who really knew God like David does were my grandparents. And so this is, this is a picture of my grandparents with my four kids. Um, I always have this picture in my mind when I think of them. And I realize, like, my kids are not that small anymore. And yes, I know they all need haircuts. But, you know, like, <laughs> we were there that day. We're taking a picture. It's so funny, though, because my grandpa, every time I would see him, he would ask me, what has the good Lord taught you today that you didn't know yesterday? And every time I'm like, um, he taught me to um, be a good boy. I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm trying to make something up, right? To the point that then when we would go visit them, I would realize, like, half an hour from grandma and grandpa's house, Oh, man, Grandpa's going to ask me, and I don't have anything. Uh, Dear Lord, can you teach me something real quick? Because Grandpa's going to ask, you know. I, I realize now Grandpa wasn't trying to, like, you know, put the screws on me or anything, and I never really came up with anything that good. What I realize is Grandpa saw God as a teacher. He wasn't afraid of God. He knew God. He, he believed that God was somebody that he could talk to that had something new for him to learn all the time that you might actually have learned something from God today. I was like, I just never thought about it like that. And the last time that I saw him alive, when I went to visit him, he couldn't really talk much anymore, but I spent some time with my grandma that day too. And one of the things she said was that she, she said, I, I don't really know why I'm still here. She was like, she was already 90. She's still alive today. She was already 90 at that point a few years ago. And I was like, well, um, you're here because I love you and I still want you here. <laughs> But she said, you know, I, I figure it's because there's still something that God wants to teach me. Man, can you think about God like that? Because at that point, my grandma had been a Christian for probably, oh man, like 75 years, something like that. And she still thinks she's learning from God. She's not bored of it. It's, it's not flat and dry and dusty and old. And it's like, it's almost like she actually knows him. I thought, I, I want that. I want to know a God like that. A God who is at my right hand, walking with me through every day. That I'm not alone as I face the things that this world brings on, whether they're difficult or whether they're exciting. That I can discover a guide worth trusting. You see, that kind of relationship, that understanding of God... That is why all of this for David comes back to gladness and joy and pleasure. So look again at those, those first verses. That first Easter egg that we uncovered. David writes this. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Sheol. And so Sheol is just kind of like the Hebrew idea of the grave. That though I die, God won't leave my soul there. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence. Get this picture of God. In your presence is fullness of joy. Like I've had some good times and there's times where I'm happy and there's times where I'm sad. But man, in God's presence... When that moment finally comes that even though his life on earth is over, he stands in the presence of God himself. It's not the terror of like, is he going to pull the lever? Because he's known God for years. It's fullness of joy. At your right hand, he says, are pleasures evermore. You see, that is the picture of resurrection. It's the promise in that phrase that his Holy One will not see corruption that Jesus' death was because each of us has fallen short of God's standard for us. And, and, and you don't have to agree with me. You don't have to like that. But that's the way that the Bible presents it. And then instead of writing the whole Bible where God's just saying, and, and let me prove it to you. Let me prove just how bad you've been. The purpose of the Bible is that God's saying, but I have a plan for you. I love you so much. I'll pay the penalty for you because I want, e even if you die, I want to resurrect you to eternal life. That's our final Easter egg. That's our final discovery. That because of resurrection, we can discover the pleasure of forever.
Because if you're picturing heaven as like everybody sitting on clouds and playing harps, apologies to harp players in the room, but that's not my picture of like pleasure forever. <laughs> and in fact, a lot of times we come to this, we say like, I thought, I thought, isn't God like anti-pleasure? Isn't God always telling us stop doing that and stop doing that and stop doing that? But you may have caught this. Chad mentioned this at the end of his message last week. It's a quote from C.S. Lewis that a lot of the things we chase in the world, the pleasures that we chase, they always leave us just a little bit empty. Some of them are destructive for us, right? We know the temptations that hurt us and we keep chasing that, that kind of broken pleasure. But even the good stuff can leave us empty. And what Chad mentioned last week is that if you realize that there are things about you that this world can't satisfy, that might be the moment you realize you're made for another world. That God has a picture of joy that lasts forever. That I actually, because of Christ, will get to see my grandpa again. That loved ones are not gone. A few years ago, uh, a musician named Bart Millard wrote a song called I Can Only Imagine. He's the lead singer of a band called Mercy Me. And I'll be honest with you, I've heard this song a million times. And whenever the radio would, would say like, now the story behind the song. I never want to know the story behind the song because so many times it comes out cheesy, it like ruins the song for me. So I like, I avoided the story behind the song. But guess what? Here's the story behind the song. Because I saw that the team had picked this song for today and my wife shared the story behind it. And I was like, oh my word. I had no idea. You see, when Bart was a kid, his happy family world just like shattered because his dad got in a truck accident, had some kind of brain damage or something, and like overnight was a completely different person. Instead of the loving father, his, his dad became abusive, verbally and ultimately physically, to the point that his mom left and Bart went from like getting beaten once or twice a month to almost every day. And, and if you've ever researched these things, you know the psychological damage this can do to a person because they feel like they deserve it. I must be bad if dad keeps beating me, but that's also mixed with the anger of this isn't fair and this is wrong. And, and he's bouncing back and forth between these two families and these two worlds just filled with so much pain. And then his dad got a cancer diagnosis. And so now his world is thrown into turmoil again, but as Bart describes his own journey, he said that when his dad got cancer, that was when his dad, facing death, started looking for something beyond this life. And his dad actually became a Christ follower. And Bart was shocked at the changes that began to happen in his dad. That even in spite of the damage from the accident, his dad was becoming less violent, more compassionate, less angry, more encouraging. And he saw this incredible transformation in his dad and it began to transform him too as he realized that all of a sudden this is a person I care about. I love my dad. And so it was hard for him when his dad ultimately lost that battle. And he feels like they hardly had any time from that repaired relationship, from the way that Jesus had changed his dad's life and now he lost him. And it was actually standing at his dad's funeral that his grandma said to Bart, I know you're sad, but remember... Jesus has given him resurrection life. And she told him, just imagine what he's seeing now. That was really the beginning of Bart's own spiritual journey. And it's why he wrote the song, I Can Only Imagine. That is more than just thinking about how cool heaven must be. But like David discovered, that the greatest pleasure, the greatest joy, is meeting Jesus himself the one who died and rose again so that we could rise again. So as you hear the band play this song, I want you to try to imagine what that would be like. Your side. 
I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine. When all I would do is forever, forever worship you, I can only imagine, I can only imagine, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel when I dance for you, Jesus? Wouldn't all of you be still Will I stand in your presence To my knees will I fall Will I sing hallelujah Will I be able to speak it all I can only imagine Yeah, I can only imagine imagine too. You know, I think I think what I want for you, but I think what God wants for you is to discover the joy of resurrection. And over the next few weeks in this series, as we lead up to Easter, a time of the year where we're thinking about new life, because I promise you the snow will melt. <laughs> it's only here for about a day. You'll hear birds chirping again. They'll be building nests. You'll see new little babies coming into the world with new life. And God has a new life for you. And so maybe as you're joining us today, wherever you are, if that's something that you want to respond to, to know that you don't have to wonder, but you can really imagine what that moment is going to be like for you, then maybe you just want to respond to God's gift of forgiveness and grace and pleasure today. And maybe you even just want to use words like these. Let's pray. God, thank you for being a forgiver. I know that I've messed up. I know that I need your forgiveness. 
and I receive it from you through Jesus. Thank you for his death and his resurrection. I want that resurrection life and I want you to be my guide. Amen. Thank you all for being here today. I'd love to see you back next week for more of our Easter Eggs series. Thank you for coming.